Hey, welcome back to session eight of CE 120C to 20C. Today we're going to spend some time talking about the uh, project one, the ones you've been working on, and kind of sharing a little about uh, sort of common things that have been occurring to people as they work on them. Some uh, tips about how to get some things completed, and talk about how to make them shareable. Ultimately, the idea is with all this stuff we're doing with the parametric design work and uh, the whole Dynamo environment. It's to sort of create an open source community where we share a lot of our work. So at the end of kind of creating your fantastic projects, it's really great to package them up in such a way that other people can use them and as a kind of see for some of their own design work. So we'll talk about sort of some tips for doing that. We are then going to go ahead and shift our focus a little bit to rather than just kind of creating elements and putting them in place, evaluating those different elements relative to different criteria. And we can think about them in terms of oh, their heights or you know how directly they face specific things. In specific, one of the forces we look at a lot is the sun because the sun's sort of a very dominant sort of force when we start thinking about sustainability <coughs> design. So being able to evaluate where different things are relative to the sun and understand how directly oriented they are. Do they face it directly or are they kind of oblique to it or completely hidden from the sun? And then ultimately responding to that evaluation information, changing the nature of our panels or the elements, either adding shading or removing shading or uh, adjusting the colors or the size of apertures, the idea is that we should be able to have things that respond very directly to you about the specifics, not just sort of a general notion of is it facing southward, but uh, kind of very specific information about how the sun is hitting that surface. So that's where we are going. In terms of uh, just getting ourselves started, by way of recap, let's just kind of revisit where we have been. You know, over the last two sessions, we've been adding panels to surfaces and looking at some common constructs for how we can take a surface, divide it up into a grid, and ultimately add some adaptive panels to that. Then we looked a little bit at how we map those um, panels to some sort of colors. If we were wanting to do something that's really more whimsical, going through and like uh, just mapping it to a photograph or something like that. But that same general principle of mapping panels to some sort of matrix of data, you know, whether it was color information looking for an image or some sort of computed information that would uh, adjust and adapt the panels based on the locations. Uh, that's kind of a very generalizable concept that's really good for us to exploit. The parametric stadium was really all about building something from the ground up, just looking at geometry and how we could go through and uh, place all the different elements, everything from the ribs to the panels around that, to the stadium seats and stuff like that. Kind of a really interesting example of, I think, the type of design we're starting to do. People sometimes wonder, you know, what is all this parametric stuff good for? And I think a really interesting and really leading application we're seeing is, as people are starting to think about buildings as really being more, well, it, it's parametric forms. It's forms where you can really distill the design intent down to some rules and then kind of change the specific building based on the geometry you're trying to accomplish, but have those still rules still apply. Um, it's a kind of very interesting way to have design that I think we're gonna get more and more into. We're seeing this a little bit. In fact, uh, one of our guests who sits in class uh, has done a lot of work in the whole notion of taking uh, different building forms and given a building form, uh, going through and trying to figure out what a structural grid would look like within that, just automatically generating that, so that if you, if you change the building form very rapidly, the grid could be automatically generated for you, which is kind of a really interesting application. We're seeing this a lot in terms of, oh, like modular and prefabricated buildings. This whole notion that really the basic, the, the, the individual building you could create could be quite specific to the length of the building, the width, all those sort of things that people want to have happen in that specific building. But that a lot of things could be laid out for you automatically. The structure could be laid out within that form, whether it's 20 feet long, 40 feet long, or 100 feet long automatically. You can place windows, you can go through and adjust all sorts of things about the design to meet some basic criteria. Not saying that parametric design is the end all, but it's a great way to get you started with a basis that you can then start customizing. So we can always kind of capture our design intent and get the design to be automated as much as possible and then use it as the basis and we sort of get the leverage of both. Okay, so that's really where a lot of this is going. In terms of assignment one, though, let's go ahead and just take a look at some of what people have been up to. 
So the idea is, hopefully by the end of the evening tonight, you'll go ahead and have something that you're going to go through and post. I was actually hoping Claire would be here. She had a really good example, although I may go ahead and kind of grab her example. Uh, let's see what else we have there. I'd like to just go to uh, talk about just sort of what people are working on. And like, uh, oh, just some of the different things we have seen in terms of what's working and what's not working and where some of the challenges are. So, yeah, does anyone have a project they would like to volunteer? Okay, is John good? Okay, or, and Lama. Okay, then uh, how about, let me go for Lamas, okay? Because actually I happen to have that one. I have a version as of yesterday okay. on my machine right. already. It's pretty similar. Pretty similar? Yeah. Okay, then let's just go, I'll bring that one up. And you can kind of talk us through a little about what it is and what you're trying to flex and all that kind of stuff. So. What I'm going to do is go back over to Revit land. What am I looking at here? Oh, I'm playing around with a little bit of Dynamo back over there. Let me go through and open up your project. OK, I have it hanging around out here somewhere. Where did it go? I'm always amazed when I open projects. I don't think you can see it down at the bottom. That would take about like four times longer to open, and there's all this flashing going on. I think it has something to do with all the recording going on and like all the stuff I have happening in the background. But let's go ahead and just, uh, I don't know, please talk us through this. What What is this interesting object I'm looking at? <laughs> So I created a bus stop, and the idea was that the shell of the bus stop would fold in to create the seat for like where people would be sitting. Um, and I defined a series of parameters to create the shape um, and the number of like ribs that were in the in the object um, on which I placed the the tubes, so like the structure of the object. Mm -hmm. um, and I also subdivided the surface of it to create, to define um, the number of panels that I would want to have on its surface. Great. Let me go ahead and we'll do some different things here. Let me just kind of hide these temporarily. Hide any of you. Oh, let me, we're going to select all instances of that. I'll hide that just so we can sort of see the fabulous structure under there. And isn't that nice? <laughs> okay, and like, what are those things? Uh, so this would be in life, I guess, the structure of the building, or uh -huh. how I thought of it would be, and, and those were just a series. So I first defined, similar to the stadium, a series of, um, of arcs mm -hmm. that would connect the points of mm -hmm. the bus station, and then I connected those points with uh, the tubes. Let's go ahead and we'll take a look at your uh, actual dynamo scripting and see what we can find. Okay, so over here. Hang on, where am I? Go back out. Dynamo's hating me, but don't worry about that little thing happening right there. Okay, let's see if we can kind of bring this up. Can we see the preview? Oh, the preview is actually what's kind of messing up in the background right there. I we need to restart Revit in terms of doing that. See what's going on here. I'm going to try turning off the preview for a second. And oh, let's see if that actually uh, cleared it up. Nope. My background preview is sort of messing up. Uh, can we see it there? Yeah, we can't right now. Well, I don't know. That's just me and Revit in terms of like uh, something going on bad with my installation. But just to go ahead and kind of take a look at that, even though my preview is not working, let's see what you got going on over here. So, can you, in, in general, what's happening over here? What's that over on the left hand side? What are all those things? Um, so, those are the way that the, the heights of the arcs and the mm -hmm. VIV arcs are defined. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, the list at the top 
um, with all those number sliders are defined as the coordinates of the arcs, and then mm -hmm. the list, the, the group of integer sliders at the bottom, define <coughs> the radii of the arcs. Okay, very good. And so the y coordinate. Oh, what is it? Seven different arcs. Yeah, seven different arcs, and Great. the center is always at zero zero. Great. <coughs> so we take those seven different arcs, we go through, and the ever popular curve point at parameter. Seems to be doing you some good. Okay, so you're breaking them up in terms of like some number of ribs that's kind of hanging around over here. Yeah. So 15 ribs, and then I just um, set the parameter for, I created a two um, family type, mm -hmm. adaptive two that we had some problems with, but eventually got fixed. Um, and then those went on the different ribs. Okay, very good. So as we're working on this, the idea of we take the list of uh, points, we transpose it, we grab some of them and put the tubes on them, super. We basically go through and grab curves and break the curves of the tubes up with even more points then based on the number of panels you want to have popping up and then put the quads on it. And yeah, it's kind of a very basic sort of approach to doing this. I think it's something I could, uh, I think Dom, yours is actually very similar to this in many ways. It's a, kind of a very common approach to doing something like this. So as we look at something like this, there's a lot that's actually working very well. Just as we look at this and you start thinking about, you know, sharing it with people and ultimately kind of making it available, the, you know, uh, some good things to think about doing are Everywhere you have something which is an input variable that you might want to flex is to really kind of highlight that. So think about this as though someone coming, is coming at it you know, completely independently who has never seen this and they saw your part, it looked really good and they just wanted to go through and be able to start using it. So things that are really good to start thinking about doing just you know, it's all fit and finish towards the end are, oh, like this code block over here, which is the number. We know that is kind of the number of panels, okay, per column. It's kind of labeling those things. Other things you can do though to make it even so stand out further is you can go through and like create groups in some of those different things. That's a really nice strategy. And think about a common color that you would always use to indicate, you know, this is the place where you can input and change things. Because then it's really easy to spot on the graph where those things are. So this is kind of the uh, number of panels per column. Okay. And if I just want to sort of highlight those oh, in some color that's really going to be very visible, I can start doing things like that. Pull that over where it is. You have some other variables that are sort of the ones that I might want to sort of tweak. This is the number of ribs. That also sounds like a really good one to be able to kind of tweak and be able to very quickly see what's going on. So maybe I can create a group out of that. And just often starting to think about pulling them into a common place so that even if people don't go very deeply into the script, they sort of see what can be easily flexed. There's all sorts of stuff in here in terms of, oh, being able to break it up. Yeah, we could say that, oh, grab the different ones. Somehow, what I'll often do is grab this one, that one, pull all of them together and say that, hey, at some level, ooh, actually, they're all pretty much right there. That this one, this one, that one, that one. All of those really are at some level all about uh, just placing the uh, panels. Okay, and I'll just distinguish those from this little block over here, which is all about these uh, transposes and that, and this one. Which are going to be more about uh, placing the ribs. 
Yeah. And just little stuff like that can make a big difference in terms of helping people understand. So go ahead and just kind of try to think uh, just about if someone else were approaching you just from the outside, how you could sort of organize your script and just make it a little more visible. I know, I think I thought when we were working together, you know, at some point you're like, oh my god, there's this bowl of spaghetti and there's just you know, code hanging everywhere. And it's sometimes hard even for us to follow the day after. But if you go back in, and I think this whole notion of grouping in colors really seems to be very, very strong as a way of going through and sharing some of this. Okay, as we think about these, some common things that have been coming on. Okay, so what is, well, it's working. For the most part, yeah, I think people have been doing a great job in terms of getting the basic geometry down and making it flexible. I always think about what is flexible, whether it's the number of ribs, the number of panels. Actually, one thing I've never tried flexing on yours, but it's buried alive right in there, is the radius. Right now they're going from 0 to 120. That's looking good. But I am just betting, since I think this is a well-designed component, if I decide to go to 0 to 270, See what's going on. Am I going to run it again? Yes, I have it. <coughs> That'll do a nice job of flexing in terms of kind of creating some more of them. I'm hoping. There's definitely some little preview program problem going on with my Revit, so I may go ahead and restart Revit here in a second. Other things that we can start changing very easily are just, you know, oh, for example, I think as we were doing a little debugging, thinking about these bench heights and really how much curvature, that stuff is kind of pretty easy to change in terms of what's going on too. So I think that's all very successful. Basically getting your geometry out is working very, very well. I think most people have been very successful at that. Some of the things that have been a little more challenging though are some of the things I've sort of seen different people struggling with. One is, a lot of us have had troubles with just creating adaptive component types, where somehow we have an adaptive component and it kind of works, but it doesn't always work, and sometimes we have trouble with the ones that are defined, you know, actually placing. And that's kind of a really common thing to have happen. Creating adaptive component types really is probably the toughest part about this. Getting the geometry and the points out there is pretty easy. But as Lon and I were working, trying to get that 7.2, but we probably tried it, I don't know, five or six different times, and it wouldn't work. And then I tried it once, and it did work. And then you say, woo -hoo, save it away, and I hope that it keeps working. As Andrew and I were working, we have some issues with, oh, I even sent a note out about the rectangular seamless panel. It seems to work lovely in so many cases. A lot of you are using it very successfully, but he's trying to apply it to a vertical wall surface, and it's not working. And it just, the symptom you get is Revit just says, as you're trying to place the panels, oh, Revit can't create the item of this type. Okay? And all you can do is sort of say delete. You don't have any choices to it. I've even run into that in class, where there's just something about the geometry and the way the mathematics is defined. There's an error. There's a bug in it somewhere. And it's just not doing what you expect. And you know, when that happens, all I can say is that really, at some level, it's sort of experimental software, and software is buggy, and it's, it's really nothing you're doing. It's just sort of a bug in the software. So when that happens, I advise you all, you know, rather than kind of working through the night, and it's so easy, it's 11, then it's 12, then it's 1, then it's and 2. Four. And it's, <laughs> it's just, you know you're going to solve it. And it just does it. Just at some point, just sort of accept that it's sort of a little bit, what is it? I don't say buggy. It's, it's just not quite stable, as stable as you'd like it to be. So, uh, or it's not bulletproof. How about that? So just let it go, or something like that. Because really, for some of those things, it may take longer to debug than what the point is that you're trying to get out of the assignment, or something like that. And that's OK. I'm, I'm very accepting about that, because with so many things in like uh, the software, just limitations that we bump into. OK. Another common thing that we sort of have seen a lot of is the whole issue of the cross products. When we take those points and we take those curves and we try to get the points on the curves and get all the points, 
Sometimes you only get a single element, and that's really a, your telltale sign that there's probably a cross product needed somewhere, as opposed to when it does shortest, it does a single point on each of the different lines, and you get something that cuts across, versus getting a matrix, which is what the cross product does for you. So watch out for that in terms of the lacing. Like, any other biggies that are sort of like floating around and biting people? Other channel? Yes, on God, what have you seen? Coloring panels, I think it only works in Java. Yes, yeah, that's another one. It's kind of an interesting one. Anga sort of ran into this with the, while we were looking at it together. And uh, we're sort of split on this. As you're defining the geometry in Dynamo, you can define that geometry to either be placed in a Revit family or in a Revit project. And I always default to thinking that it's going to go into a Revit project, but Revit families actually work a lot of the time, too. Um, one of the few differences, there's some things you just can't do in families, some things you can, that you can't do in projects. But one of the things that we ran into is if you want to do override the uh, panel colors, that sort of uh, operation is only available in a Revit project. It's not available in a family. Okay. Yeah, um, I sent out a note yesterday that basically said, hey, if you have it in the wrong type, no worries, just go ahead and save your Dynamo script, open a project file as opposed to a family file, and if everything's being generated out of the geometry, no problems. You should be able to just kind of just really recreate the entire thing there. But like I think llamas, viewers, we could just as easily have made that inside of a family that would then be placed as a whole as opposed to putting as individual elements, and there's kind of pluses and minuses, depending upon whether you want the larger project to treat that as a series of you know 100 individual elements or just as a single block. Yeah, and there's, there's goods and bads in that. It's if I was doing a big site design, I might want your thing as a family to be dropped on the site. So I'm over with parametrically designed family. Okay. Any other cool ones kind of hanging out there? Any other? Anyone else want to volunteer their example? Anga, do you have something? I do. Andrew, what you got? You know what? It'll take a while to upload that. I mean, um, I'll also have to email them my code. I haven't uploaded it yet. Okay, no worries. Grace. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll show it off after the end class or something. Okay, that sounds good. So I'm good. Do you want to like, uh, uh, and you can put it on a thumb drive too if it's easy. Can you put yeah. it on a folder? Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. It's already on the folder. No worries. I got a thumb drive right here. Put it all in a folder there so we can find it. Yeah. Oh, you did get all those. Oh, and you're even mapping on top of that. Mm -hmm. This um, is groovy. Yeah, I have one. It took a while to make it. So I ended up making arches rather than yeah. individual panels in there. It's looking nice, though. You sure you don't want to show this? Sure, we can try it. Well, it's not a OK, let's do that. How about that? As these guys are putting things on a thumb drive, let me talk about how we're going to share and submit these projects, because that's kind of a, the next little piece of it. So as they're working, let me kind of go with that. Ultimately, you want to put these out there in a way that make it very accessible. So here's what I always recommend doing. A, create a big zip archive that has all the pieces that are necessary. So that'll typically include your Revit project, it might have any Revit custom family, so if you've made a custom adaptive component, throw that in there. It'll probably already be loaded in a Revit project, but it's nice to kind of put it out there separate so people can get it. You're going to have your main Dynamo graph file, the DYN file. And you might also have some custom nodes, just depending upon, we'll talk about the custom nodes a little bit later today. If you've downloaded some custom nodes, or if you've created some custom nodes, you, know, you might have some of those too. But the idea is get everything you can into a single folder. The nice thing is, is even if people don't have the custom nodes loaded into their own system, if the custom nodes and everything is in that folder, and the open folder, when you open things, it'll find everything in kind of that little local environment. So generally create a big old zip archive that includes all those things. Another really good thing to do, just in the scheme of documentation, and we don't have to get too hung up on this, is just a little overview of what your package is. So it's nice if you can put a little like a screen image that kind of shows what it actually, a lot of people like to see, oh, that's really cool. Like as soon as I saw the image of what Andrew did, I thought, oh, that's really cool. I might want to try that. Yeah, 
oh, you know, two sentences about what it does. You might have a little bullet list of uh, just, you know, what's included that you need to sort of install. So the little things are sort of related. What's not included, if you don't have everything self-contained, uh, yeah. Tell people what else they need to download to run it. Because I always make that mistake, oh, I do something in Lunchbox, or I do something with uh, quads from Rectangular Grid, and I don't download it. So it's nice to let people know. Something about how to use it, and you can either describe what the parameters can be parametrically changed, or even in the Dynamo graph, go through and highlight the inputs, kind of let people know where to go in terms of finding some of those things. And then, this is one that I say run to a lot of people. I think everyone gets to the point with this project where, you know, oh, you put all the time in it, you know, you have ideas for the next five things you could do that if only you had another 20 hours and no other classes you would go <laughs> ahead and do, but you don't. So, nothing else, just uh, put some little uh, pointers there. Uh, yeah. If I had more, yeah, this is what I would do. This is where you could keep exploring it. Yeah, for your own ideas. Maybe the next person will pick that up and sort of use that as inspiration for what they're going to do as they continue to enhance. And that's the way it kind of works with a lot of this stuff is, you know, Zach will put stuff out there in the community, someone will grab it, make some changes, they'll put it out in the community, and it just kind of keeps building on each other. So it's a really nice thing. So once you have those things, the Dynamo uh, zip file, or the file for all those things, and the description of what's going on, the big thing you want to do is go ahead and post it to A360. And let me talk about that. Okay, I've got things here. But let me, I'll just continue this thread, and then we'll uh, go back and look at these other examples. By A360, what I mean is this. There's this site called Stanford Revit, autodesk360.com, which is a site which is really like a big file sharing site. But the nice thing is we can all put our files up there and share links, and everyone can very easily start to see your models. So what's happening out there, and I think I've invited, invited most people to join the site, but if not, we'll go ahead and join you right now. There's a bunch of different projects that are set up for different classes. So we have our own project over here, CE 120C, 220C. You see there's some different things for global AEC teams. The B team class has its own separate folder. Within that project, okay, we have different people. So who's there right now? So Andrew, Claire. Uh, let's go ahead, I'm going to invite a few more people to this, and at some point you'll get a message that'll say, go ahead and Dominique, let's get you in there. Dominique is in there. Yeah, okay. I would already be there because of last year. Oh yeah, yeah no, you'll be in the list, I know, yeah. there you are. Okay, and Lama, let's see if you are, do I have? Oh, you're on the left, and that's uh, a. But no, that's those are folders I've created. But actually, oh. we have to get you into the project. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Elbatar. Was that? It's Elbatar. My email. Elbatar. Do I have you in there? Maybe not. Now let me just go ahead and let's go ahead. And I got Dom, so we don't have you. Let me send this out. Okay, so for the others, go ahead and go over the, yeah, do what you need to. Um, accepted. That's all good. Okay, let me just add you back in this little system too. I got it. Add it. Okay. It's going to be based on your Autodesk ID. Well, actually, no, this actually will go by to an email. But I think I may have already invited you, but let's see if it's, you've joined yet. Um, invite. Okay. La, 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 la. Oh. And El Batar. Yeah, that's number five. Okay, check it out. I'm going to see, it's kind of looking like you may already exist in my system in another way. Because I have two different ways of having you in here. You could be contributors, but not actually members. Do you have it in there? No? 
Don't type it over there. Okay, see if you get an email message. Well, there you are. You are a team member. So why does it not show up in here? What's going on here? Oh, did I make you inactive? Yeah, it says inactive. Well, we got to fix that. That's certainly not true. Okay. Now you activate it. Great. Okay, so now I can go back to the portal and add you back in there. Let's see what we got in here. Invite. Okay. What will happen is when you log in to Stanford Revit, the Oliver360.com, over here in the uh, upper right hand corner there's a little bell icon and there will be some sort of notification over there saying, hey, Glenn has invited you to join the project. So uh, go ahead and just accept. Okay, when you accept and you have uh, gotten yourself added in there, you'll just be able to get into this folder and then we have um, some different folders set up for people. So for example, if today I was masquerading as Domini, I'd go into her folder and I would just uh, go over here and I'd say, let's go ahead and upload some files. I'm gonna go through and upload a file what am I going to do? I'll just upload the session eight examples as a starting point. Mm -hmm. So you can get rid of that later. So you see any little uh, notifications up in the corner? Yeah, this folder listing restricted for you on the stove. This is okay. Let's go. Did you come up to over here? Is there anything over there waiting for you, like a little notification? Let's see if we got that. Oh, how about just. Go to, yeah, that, uh, and then just go into, I think the way they invite you is kind of strange. Just go to that site and log in. No worries. Go over here and say accept the invitation. Okay, and then it'll let you in. Same thing for you. So what you do is, rather than trying to go right into the project, go into 360.com, right there, okay, and log in. And then over here, there's some notifications about some things I've invited you to. Accept those, and then it'll let you in. So you will see, even though this is not Dominic's example, but I threw it in there just as an example, the folders hanging around out there. If Dominic would now like to share it with everybody, what you can do is choose that. Actually, that's going to download it. Come back over here. I can select it and then go through and click this little button which is for sharing and if you share the big thing you want to grab is this link right here share the item with anyone using this link because that link right there is the link that we can then post in canvas and go through and have anyone download the file just by clicking on that link so that's what I mean is your public sharing link. Okay, so Angar, are you in? Yes. Lama, are you in? Dominique, are you in? I think so. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So. I think I requested access, but I have not yet. Let us see. What do I have here? Good, sit. Request access again. And we'll let your ID in. Or let's make sure you're in the member list. Hang on, let me try that. The first one is your name. The first is your Oh, sorry. Let's get the name. Let's see if you're over here. Okay, let's come back over into my manage list and see if you're here. Okay, what's your last name? here. You're active. Maybe we just need to add you into the project. Okay, let's try this. Am I spelling you right? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Often that's a risk around here. <laughs> okay, uh, let's invite you. A little bit of Zen action. Oh, I have two of them. Which one would you prefer? Uh, the top one. 
Okay. Okay. So looks like Dominic's there. Almost everyone's there. So see if uh, that opens up for you. When you do go there, oh, and also for this list of folders over here, if I've messed up your name or oh, it was like Claire actually, uh, she's a different name now. She's married. So uh, just go through and rename your folder if you want to have a different name in there. That's okay. Let's do deep sync. <laughs> I just do mine. Uh, you changed the door, yeah. <laughs> okay. Whatever it takes. Okay, and then get yourself in. Oh, beautiful. Okay, I think we're all there. Woohoo! Okay, so throw your things in there, copy your links, you're going to be good there. Then at the tail end of all that, when you come back over to assignments, uh, and there's some sort of thing where after you choose the assignment, there you get a, so you have a submit button or something like yeah, that, and it I believe is it it's certainly set up it's certainly it's now set up as a text entry box. So go ahead and put in your little description of what it is and paste the link in there. Okay, that's the gist of it. Let's go ahead and take a look at kind of some of these other projects because I think there's some cool stuff hanging around out here. Where do we have the image of our project? Say again? Where do we have the image of the project? Oh, um, I would just like to do a screenshot when you're in the middle of, uh, when you have it open in Revit. Okay, and just upload it as part of a zip folder? Yes. Okay. Let's put it in there. Exactly. Okay. That's good. Yeah, in the submit, the little text entry block. I think you can even sort of load an image into that. I'm not sure, but if not, just throw it in the folder. Okay. That's good. Okay, so let's go back over and see what we have here. My little preview is not looking so good, so I am actually going to close Revit completely just to see if I can kind of clear up that little error in the preview. Looking not so bad. Let me reopen Revit. And we'll see what else we have in here. which I don't want right now. I'll say let's open. Let's go out and see if we can find on God's goodies. We'll say uh, USB drive. And where are you, Mr. On God? Find, find the assignment on the right. Uh, on there the it is. E yeah, excellent. So this is the Revit family, Revit family. Oh, you're still, you're still inside of a family. Yeah, I'm still inside. No worries. Which one would you prefer? The sine wave one? Uh, both, yeah. Okay. I guess sine wave, sine wave, both. Okay. We'll just, we'll go right to the, <laughs> right to the uh, really interesting one. Because I think several people have played this game. This is a common thread. This notion of like starting with a straight line and replacing some one of the straight lines with a sine wave. So. I started off with saying, I wanted to create a structure that could be used as a parking lot, bus stop, airport terminal. Depending on the height of your. Wow. Now, so this is certainly a very exuberant structure. I love that word. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a wave on both sides in the canopy. It's kind of a flat line in the back, and it's a wave across the front. Yeah, that's right. And then we have some nice <coughs> canalization in the middle. Yep. And you have these very big, bold, tapered tube elements. Mm -hmm. okay. Looks like you also have, tell me about your panel here. Is that the aperture panel? Which one? Yeah, aperture panel. Very good. Excellent. So for all these things, there's a lot of things we can start doing. We can start changing, oh, this whole issue of 
You know, for example, if we like those to be thick or thin. This is a type parameter, so it would actually change it for all the different ones. So do a little regenerating, okay? Or we have all these little tapered tubes. So a lot of things we can sort of start playing around with this. But let me go ahead and open up your script and you can tell us something interesting to uh, change there. So I'll go back into Dynamo. So in some ways, this is a similar sort of approach. This is kind of like Lama and Dominique. They're sort of very you know, linear sort of structures that then sort of, or you know, uh, Lama had a more of an arcing structure, but very cool, sort of like uh, just put down some interesting geometry, okay, and uh, then exploit it. Come back over here. Little Mr. On God action in here. So there was my Dynamo script. Yep. Which, one, which one do you prefer? Sunday. Uh, the first one. The first one? At 4 o'clock in the afternoon? Yeah. Great. Okay. Lots of nice color coding. I like this. Okay. So, tell us where we should go. What, what should we be looking at? Or point me towards the direction where if I uh, change some sort of parameter, we'll see it happening in the structure. Sure. I think what do you think is interesting? If you go towards the left, you can change the height. The first thing you can change is probably the height of uh, Z value. Okay, oh wow. Let me zoom on out. This is, this is quite the uh, involved script there. Wow. Actually, I created everything from scratch, so it's probably not the right idea of it. No worries. Okay, and we're keep the code clean. Very nice. Creating uh, the delta for x and y, selecting the z. Yeah, if you can, if you can change the delta, you can change. Uh, so is it the delta or the yeah. z? Which one should I change? You uh, can choose. I think if you do, I, I don't remember to be honest, but I think if you change z, uh, it should change the height of the structure. Okay, no worries. Let me zoom to fit out there so we can just sort of see this thing. So again, over here, oh, let's try 25. You have to get around the business. Oh, very good. I see a little amplitude. That sounds like it's going to change the amplitude of the wave at the top of the sine curve. What's the delta for x and y? 35. Is that how far the wings exactly. spread out? Exactly. So I basically took in uh, the input was the bottom, the, the, the curve which is at the bottom, which is flush with the x, y, k. Mm -hmm. And then all the other curves are derived from that. So those are the only, like those three points are the only points that are input. And then everything else is an offset from those points. Fantastic. So the vertical uh, yeah. Z direction, so it changed uh, the height as well as yeah. the Yeah. Actually, well, this is sort of the height of the curve. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, what's happening here, there's two different versions because I didn't eliminate the old one. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. I'm getting the idea of it. So that was actually kind of cool in terms of popping that out. Let's go ahead and I'm going to take this out again, just because we'll regenerate it. Any, okay, there you can see all my little preview points. So X and Y, that's how far it spreads out. Amplitude is how tall the wave is. Exactly. Ah, so if, for example, I change that to like 15 or something like that, let's just sort of see. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's kind of cool to think that you can have something that is so complex actually have uh, this much variability. And so what else, I could change the parameter, the panels. Mm -hmm. I could change the parameters of the panels. You can change the height. You can change how far it goes out on the, uh, on the right and the left. Mm -hmm. So that's very picky. Okay, very cool. And okay. you can change the number of waves you want on the end of the, of the uh, in terms of like a single wave or multiple exactly. waves. So right now it's set to 10 sine waves being completed. So that integer slider right below the code block mm -hmm. is where you can figure out how many sides. If you change that to one, it just goes to 360 degrees. And then right now it goes to 360 times. I see. Number of Very good. So for this, this is actually, uh, you know, yeah, I think you got it all grouped in nicely, either by kind of uh, changing some of the names of the notes yeah. or kind of uh, putting them in their own special colors or something like that. 
try to make that really visible so they can like people zoom in on it because yeah, it's such a nice big graph. <laughs> okay. Okay, I hope we'll get to today, not today, tomorrow, or the next time. We'll, we'll talk about how we're going to start taking these bigger blocks and breaking them into subroutines, which then make it a little bit easier to manage because you're going to find there's certain chunks of code you use an awful lot, mm -hmm. and it's good to sort of break them into little subgroupings and make a hierarchy of them. Excellent. Okay. And I think you also change the color of the panels. So there's the opportunity to change. Go, if you go in the extreme right, you can go and change the color of the panels. Got it. But this is still a family, or is this a project now? Oh, this is a family. There's yeah. a screenshot with, uh, if you just want to pull up the screenshot, that has the various colors. OK, let's take a look at that. Okay, so back at here to the nearby USB drive. A little bit of on God action. And oh, there's a screenshot. So colored panels. Yep. So actually, there are. Two oh, I see. You have a lot of vari variations of that. Okay, that's really cool. Okay. So this is just a single color on a yellow on both panels, I and mean, then there the, is the one which has different colors. One side is red, one side is yellow. Fantastic. So it's nice to go through and yeah, you can almost start having a little manual for how to use your thing where there's different screenshots illustrating what the effect of uh, the different panel changes are and stuff like that. Ooh, check that out. Okay, and then in terms of the aperture panels. Excellent. Okay, let's take a look at Mr. Andrews and see what that's looking like. So if I close up on guns. And I open Andrews. Let's do this. So open. And where are you, sir? So I think it's Kong Andrew 71. There it is. Okay, so shall we start with which one? Open up the adaptive or families here? This looks like it's yeah. families and project. Did you get the project too? I, I got families. Not it. Perhaps you can copy. Is that all that's in that form? Yeah. No, not quite. No, no. So I just have the family because there's the panel. Yeah, I guess I didn't call And there's the arch. Uh -huh. There it is. You put it on there quick. Sure. No, you're, you're, it's so cool. I want you to be able to show it. <laughs> it's like, you gotta celebrate good work. Some of the other ones, we have a very interesting sine wavy bus stop over here that's uh, kind of rolling along. We actually have another sort of bus stop that's really more of an enclosed structure. It's almost like a nautilus shell kind of shape with a really cool sine wavy bench inside. So a lot of cool things. You should always be looking at each other's stuff. We, we learn from each other. Take a look at this one. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Are these colors they were on yours, or mine are a little different? They're the same colors. Oh, very good. Only the adaptive panels have coloring, and then there's mass arches that aren't seen by detail. So, 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 so walk us through. Tell us what we're looking at here. First, enable the uh, massing. Oh, okay. Very good. Okay, so I'll go over to massing in sight. And I'll just turn on the masses. I don't know if there's a way to apply walls to masses. Oh, so you have some arches right there. OK, so you're thinking about actually just putting some walls in there? Yeah. Like no, a, applying those to those? OK, so like on that surface. Hang on, I'll get to it. Something like that. Fantastic. So that's looking pretty good. OK. So got a couple things going on here. So there's the arches. There's vertical sections that have adaptive walls, and then there's these um, semicircle arcs that form the roof. Mm -hmm. of the, what we call a bus stop, basically referenced off of a 
people to still get busted off. Very good. And let's talk about how you do this, because this is actually kind of really cool. You have this generic adaptive arch piece. Yes, I just made a arch similar process to extruding the tube in the adaptive components lesson. Well, let's just go ahead and take a look at that. I'm sort of curious. I extruded a rectangle across a part uh, line. Okay, so if the arch is right there. Okay, so tell me about this. You have three points. So the three points is uh, if you turn on X ray or mm -hmm. wireframe mode, there should be a reference arc going through the three points. Somewhere there. It may actually be right along the axis of the yeah. extrusion. But at any rate, there's three adaptive points, and there is a reference line um, using a, I believe it says, starts. And the center. Part. Yeah. Maybe it's going the other order. Okay. Uh, and that arcs. that's good because that'll always form an arch. Okay. Because the the two ends and the center height. Okay. That'll always give you like an arch shape. Okay. Got it. Um, and then within this one, probably the hardest part was making the rectangle in the right go in the right order because mm -hmm. sometimes when you make the uh, names rounder the thickness and width, it will choose the wrong edge as your base. And mm -hmm. move the other part with it. Mm -hmm. So I believe I have to start at the point and go up and then right. That In terms of tracing that line around there. Tracing. And rectangle would fail out there. Right? We, we had many similar things. And we had issues about whether that's a reference line or a model line. That seemed to make a difference. As we were doing a sine wave bench, we had the whole issue was it on the inside or the outside? And I tried to be so clever and flip it. It all did flipping, it was flipped it over. It didn't flip it on the outside. Yeah, this one flips. Outside, but not under or over. It's and then no, if I want to do it under or over, I just do a new rectangle like those on the underside. Line and probably work out. But this is a really nice part. Is now based on these three points, and you just compute in your model like the the bottoms and the top of the arch, and it makes this perfectly smooth like arch across the top of it. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Okay, so. If I go back and open up your Dynamo, let's just go see what your model looks like in there. So I'll say uh, add in. Did I Dynamo open or in the background somewhere? I'll have to select the project. Actually, why not? It's always so you're trying to place a wall right now. Oh, we're in the middle. Of, oh, that's right. We're in the middle of our action. So let's go ahead and go back out here. And for those walls, okay, you panelize those using the extruded panel. We ran into yes. some problems with that. That's a slightly modified extruded panel. The only difference is that there is an instance parameter that tells you the thickness. Got it. And then from that, are you just mapping like a, an image of some type, or how do you actually determine the colors? So I found a random list function, which gives you a random list of some length and it's random colors. Oh, really? OK, it's just a random pattern. Cool. Uh, the arc types are also random. Oh, very cool. OK, so if I'm popping around in here. So green are the controls. Down in here. So there's also some more to the left, which is also a bit more interesting. This one, I think, just controls the panelization. Number of red green, or red dish color panel grids on the surface. Got it. <coughs> here you get length, depth, number of segments, um, what I call the amplitude, which tells you how high Arc's going to jump. Mm -hmm. And equipment else is in here. I think those are the main three. Uh, there's one more, which is the thickness. Mm -hmm. So that just tells you how thick do you want all these panels to be. Very good. Some things I'll point out about this that are really kind of nice. Yeah, the names are sort of really explicit about what's going on. It's nice to all group together. In here, where we put all these different formulas in a code block, and you can really put a whole bunch in a single code block. You really are creating for every row of formula and output. The other thing is actually sort of embedded some comments is actually kind of good to sort of explain what is that silly thing you're doing. So you do that by slash, asterisk, comment, asterisk, slash. Anything between there is a term as a comment. And you cannot put the comments at the end of the line because that will just make it a new line. Ah, very cool. Now over here, 
I saw there were a couple of red things, and I think it's probably just because I probably don't have something loaded that you use. Yeah, so, so, there got. so this one's interesting. So what I haven't figured out how to do is handle multiple surfaces. Uh, in this case, the, that orange group controls putting adaptive panels, or maybe just regular panels, in the section between the arch piece and yes. the, the segmented color pieces. Mm -hmm. So here I have some variable number of surfaces, mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem to like running across the project very well. So when I make a quad grid by points, if you don't delete the screen one out, um, you'll end up getting panels that both go up and down like you expect, but also diagonally. Ah, okay. So you have to work on kind of the list so and. Every other object in the Very cool. Excellent. Probably a better way to do it by. Oh, there's, a, control, so. there's always some yeah other way. But that's okay. Oops, we're off on the screen. Hey, Marie, what are you up to? <laughs> okay. These are fantastic. Thank you for agreeing to share. Make sure to put it out there. Um, just pull things together uh, and like, uh, make them very shareable. We should all learn from each other. But these are just really fantastic. I'm so much happier that you guys find your own projects and kind of came up with something you wanted to kind of explore parametrically. You know, I, I, I make up all sorts of weird examples that are you know interesting or not. But these actually feel really, really cool, and you've taken them to a really nice level in terms of you know, we get an awful lot of uh, control and like that flexibility. I'm like, super. Let us do this. Let's go ahead and take our break right now. And if you can come back in five, we will shift our attention to that whole issue of patterning, that sort of every other thing, and that sun, and really how we think about the sun and how it's hitting us. So please rejoin us in about five, and we will continue. <laughs>